The Museum of Modern Art has made a home for the works of Pablo Picasso, which are as varied as the visitors who come to see them each year. The question about Picasso, arguably the most important and influential artist of the 20th century, might be, is there anything he didn't do well? Those looking for a weak spot will once again be disappointed by the exhibit at MoMA dedicated to his printmaking, Picasso, Themes and Variations. The approximately 100 works on display serve as a thread through the weave of his many subjects and treatments. Curator Deborah Y helps guide Canapé into the artistic habits of a towering genius. The origins of the exhibit is based on the museum's permanent collection of prints by Pablo Picasso. We have an extraordinary collection of over a thousand prints. When he worked in printmaking, he often would come up with a theme, almost like a story. And he'd work on one copper plate and then take his characters to the next copper plate to see what they'd do. And in later years, he called that his form of writing fiction, actually. And printmaking just lent itself to that. The other thing that I wanted to show is the way Picasso's thought process changed when, from the time he began a print to the time he stopped working on that project, because he'd go through very many stages. And at each stage, he would print an example of the progress he had made. And he liked to keep all those prints because he really thought that it was the whole group together that represented the work of art, not any particular stage. That first series that he made, the first print was in the blue period, it's called The Frugal Repast, and it shows a really poverty-stricken couple sitting at a table with not much food on the table. And the figures are very bony, uh, so they look as if they haven't eaten very much for a long time, and, and they glance aside and, and look kind of sad or in despair. In Cubism, Picasso was someone who liked a catalyst, and I think that when he worked with Brock, there were kind of sparks flying all the time, and each day they'd go to their studios and say, what did you do today, what did I do today, that kind of thing. The Minotaurs are part of the period when Picasso really became an engaged printmaker. He was influenced by surrealism. From that point on, the Minotaur became his, his alter ego, really. And so the Minotaur could be lascivious and could be really violent, but he also could uh, show contrition and be despairing. And the sort of crescendo of the Minotaur series is a very large print called Minotaur Amaki. And that title combines the Minotaur myth with Toromaki, which is the word for bullfighting. You see a very violent bullfighting scene in the middle, and then you see a Minotaur who looks as if he's really lost and despairing. And you see a young girl uh, guiding them, which perhaps is symbolic of the young woman that he was having an affair with. So these are always very, have very complex iconography. Each time a new woman entered his life, he had a kind of burst of creative energy. And some periods of his work are even called, you know, the Dora period or the Marie Therese period, using the first names of some of these women. And his work is just filled with uh, portrayals of them. Some that are very tender and, and you can tell that he felt great love for them. Other times they become almost just an excuse to do a formal experiment, and sometimes they look like they're filled with the anger that he felt toward them, as opposed to what they felt toward him. And in 1968, when he was 86, um, he made, in less than seven months, a series called The Sweet 347, just making sometimes three and four compositions a day. And they're quite extraordinary. And it gave him the opportunity, most scholars think, to look back on his long life and his art and revisit those people and the motifs that he found. So right up until the end, he was an active printmaker.
my poor daddy. Yeah. It's a crowded market out there in the land of indie flicks. It's not just that no one wants to throw money at you to make your movie. Even worse, some folks don't even want to show it. And that's where a film festival programmer steps in. Case in point, the New York lensed micro budget drama Daddy Longlegs, directed and written by brothers Benny and Josh Safdie. Sometimes it takes a Frenchman to see America in its details. Olivier Père of the Director's Fortnight at the Cannes Film Festival knew a true American indie when he screened it. Canapé takes its own look. Sorry, man. That's this guy. He's the breadwinner. I want, um, excuse me. Special change. We're in the middle of a conversation. Excuse me, I, I, um, I have to use that round. Oh, don't use them as funny, huh? Toilet in there. Oh, look at quick. Look, I've been sitting here on, on my ass. Man, you're addressing the wrong guy. This is the bank. Hey, you got, show him what you got. You show him what you got. Don't, don't give it to him. I, don't I give it to him. I said show it to him. I bet you got some money in your pocket. I bet you got some money. Hey, look, hey, he got money in his pocket, don't he? He gave you all that, right? He got some money in your pocket. I bet you got some money in your pocket. Look, you don't want them to see you looking, looking, looking like bad like that. Come on, look, man. Look, man. Playing with my kids. Hard. You asked for hard. money. We don't have any. I'm okay. playing with my kids. So just a little distance, all right? Good luck. Come on, I've been sitting here on my ass all yeah. day. <laughs> I've, yeah, well, I've been on my money. feet all day, man. Oh, shit. Yeah, get it quick. All right, all right, come on. Forget the money. Come on, guys. Forget it. Coming. Ray, over on my side. Don't walk behind me. <laughs> all right, no joking. No joking when we cross the street. Hold on to my belt loops. I can't see. Sage, are you holding on to my belt? Buddy? <laughs> Shake it, buddy. It, it started, we had, we knew we wanted to make a, a movie about our childhood at some point and it, at times before it was something different where it was like a different part of our childhood and then it grew into something where it became more of the movie and go get some rosemary and we started we knew that we wanted to focus on the times when it was crazy and there was complete madness and for two weeks you could think of a thousand things and make it seem like uh, months and months and months which is what his whole plan is and then we knew we wanted to see that and we kept thinking that for us it was strange to to leave our father behind after some such a crazy magical time, but what what could it have been like inside for him? You know, after after going through the same thing, but us having something else to move on to and to experience, like what what did he have after that? And the, just thinking about that, and then wondering what it's like to take take us back, and just that whole the, all those ideas just really were what built the story and built the structure of the story. Guys, oh my God. Oh, now we have revenge. Now, revenge of the Ronzo. Oh, revenge. All right, guys, let go. I can't, come on, I can't get up. Come on. Stop, guys. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Guys, let go of me. Wait, come on. Hey, hey, get him off me. Get him off me. Get him off me. Get him off me. All right, come on, guys, seriously, let get up. He's holding on. Come on. No, that's not. He's they're holding me. They're holding me. We wanted the story to move in a way that you know, was akin to the, you know, the ideas and the and the feeling of the movie. Like, you know, when he first gets them, you know, it, it's sloppy. He's he's not performing well. I don't know if you've had this experience, but like I've had it with my father, and I've seen it with, you know, like it's it's a really weird situation to be in for a father to be with his kid and feel it, it's like an awkward silence between you like I mean I've only experienced it a couple times and maybe that's because I kind of at times feel a little estranged with my father but you know that feeling of like feeling you know feeling the need to perform for your own child is was really really important mostly it's just it, it was an 
exercise for us to try and not recreate memories, but like recreate the feelings of those memories. And all of that preparation was working towards recreating that emotion. Faster, go faster. You guys think? Oh, you're good. Hey, check it out, guys. Sage, Sage. Hi, baby. Over here, over here. I need some help. All right, what do you want me to catch for dinner tonight? Salmon. Salmon. All right. All right. I learned this in the army. All right, anchor me. I got one. I got one. I got one. Ah, oh, we got away. We got away. Hang on. Hang on. We're still going for salmon. All right, hold on to my waist. I need my waist. All right, guys. Lower me, lower me. Ah! Ah! Pull me in, pull me in, I got it! Ah! Ah, got away, got away! Oh. He speaks so poetically about film, you know, as most of the French do. You know, it's just so impassioned and so respectful. And, and you know, he said to us, he's like, you know, you guys have grown here and, you know, we need to um, we need to give homage to this in other in, para, yeah. in paraphrasing by inviting you back this year because you're not just a inspiration to New York filmmakers you're an inspiration to everyone now and that's crazy and crazy thing for him to say. The response wasn't just it's accepted and like come here it was just like they he really understood and everybody well, really understood. The perfect the perfect quote is Stefan's quote yeah. when he's like when he sent the email. It was 4:30 um, in the morning. It was 4:30 in the morning our time. And uh, that's when he first heard from everyone else that they all liked it too and they wanted to invite it. And Stefan Delorme said at the end, he goes, um, right now you and your brother are probably sleeping, like the two little boys in the film, but just like them, you will have a good wake up. <laughs> and I thought that was, you know, who, that, yeah. who says that? Yeah. It's amazing. Perfect lighting. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> good, I know. <laughs> Music may be a universal language, but it is spoken with different accents. In that sense, the award-winning young trumpeter Ibrahim Malouf, who was born in Lebanon and now lives in France, speaks several musical tongues fluently. His repertoire includes the greatest pieces of Bach and other classical European composers, the range of modern jazz, and the lesser known but rich tradition of classical Arabic music. He once again shows his chops, as musicians put it, on his new recording, Diachronisms. Canapé knows when to listen. Classical uh, education. Uh, I actually did uh, classical studies in Paris, and uh, I also grew up with uh, a Middle East uh, music, uh, traditional music, in my years. My father invented this trumpet uh, like 45 or 50 years ago now. He was the first one to, to have the idea of playing Arabic scales on trumpets. And uh, he actually gave this uh, to me when I was 17. Uh, and I I'm not sure I'm now the only one because I have students who now I'm teaching to play Arabic music on trumpet. And my father did the same a few years ago. So now there are more and more people around the world uh, starting to play on this trumpet. But um, 
It's true that my father invented a, a total different way to play trumpet, a, a, a new way to play trumpet that doesn't exist anywhere else. It's not this, the way you play jazz, it's not the way you play classical music, it's not the way you play Latin uh, salsa things. Uh, it's totally different. La façon avec laquelle euh, mon, mon père a, a, a expulsé l'air de, de ses poumons euh, est complètement différente parce que le, le souffle est, est retenu avec une certaine intensité qui est assez proche de la façon avec laquelle les chanteurs arabes euh, chantent ce qu'on appelle le tarab. Le tarab, euh, euh, c'est euh, une expression musicale euh, euh, typiquement arabe euh, qui est dans une certaine expression euh, très, très marquée, très insistante. Ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on ne trouve pas dans, dans, dans le jazz ou dans le classique ou dans la musique latino. Et c'est une façon de jouer la trompette qui n'existe pas auparavant. Et donc, euh, instinctivement, euh, au moment où je prends la trompette et je joue ce style-là spécifiquement, je prends cette attitude-là et je prends cette, euh, cette, euh, cette technique-là. What I do in my albums has nothing to do with what I do on stage and uh, it's important for me because uh, I think that when you work on an album you work for hours, hours, weeks, months, years on something that uh, will become a, like a soundtrack that you will be listening to when you're in the metro, in taxi, in the street or at home and um, in live something else has to happen and I also like this because uh, you can do mistakes in life, but people sometimes they even like the mistakes you're doing even more than the music you're doing and there's, there's something really concrete happening. I, I, I really love all those, uh, all those uh, kinds of uh, um, creating uh, aspects of music. Films about filmmaking go back as far as the early silent era. There seems to be an endless fascination for how the magic is made and by whom. Producers are usually the villains, seldom the heroes. The immensely talented young French director Mia Hansen Love puts a harried but humane producer at the center of her second feature film, The Father of My Children. Canapé explores the topic with the director and her lead actor Louis Do de Lanxin. The film was inspired by Amber Balzan. He was a uh, a very f famous French producer of, of uh, independent films in France. He produced a lot of films, like 60 films or something. And that's some, it's someone I met uh, uh, in 2004. He wanted to produce my first film. And I... I uh, so he was about to produce my film when he died. And then I, I made my first film with other producers. And um, after the shooting, I... I began to think a lot about, about this, but I wasn't sure at all it was a good idea to make a film about this, but the, prob the problem was that that was the only film I, I had to do, I wanted to do. It was like an obsession. C'est un film sur l'engagement. J'ai rarement autant ressenti dans ma vie à quel point quelqu'un pouvait s'engager par passion et se, d'une certaine manière, se sacrifier. Je dis pas ça pour le, le sacraliser, parce que je dis pas qu'il avait que des qualités, mais en tout cas, il y, avait, il y avait chez lui un amour du cinéma et une passion et, et une, une, une sincérité. J'ai envie de faire des films sur des gens que j'aime. 
et sur des gens qui m'impressionnent ou qui m'émeuvent ou dont je ressens une intériorité. Ou, et, euh, et finalement, mon premier film, même s'il était très différent et, qui traitait, et que le personnage principal était très différent, voire même à l'opposé, au fond, euh, ce que je, je filmais des acteurs dont je trouvais qu'ils avaient du charme. Et là, c'est le sujet même du film, d'une certaine manière, parce que c'est un producteur qu'on n'évoque pas sans évoquer son charme, c'est sa force, euh, sa beauté intérieure est indissociable de, de, du charme de sa présence. Et, et c'est la chose que, que j'ai le plus essayé de filmer peut-être. J'ai pensé à Louis de l'Andien assez tôt, parce que je l'avais. Enfin assez tôt après avoir écrit le film, mais, mais je l'avais je l'avais vu au théâtre, je, je l'avais rencontré plusieurs fois et donc je. J'avais été frappée en fait par sa ressemblance avec Humbert, mais néanmoins pas du tout sur la personnalité. Il n'a absolument pas la même personnalité, mais, mais juste, un, il se trouve que c'est un très bon acteur et que physiquement, il avait des qualités qui me permettaient de, 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 de trouver ça. Et j'ai ressenti vraiment en le voyant qu'il que pouvait avoir à la fois le rayonnement et la vulnérabilité du personnage que que je voulais filmer. Ben, Mial m'a demandé d'être très... Euh, de toujours travailler sur euh, la gaieté, la vivacité, être très avec les gens, très réconfortant, très chaleureux, très... voilà. Ce qui n'était pas forcément le plus facile pour moi. Le reste, ça venait tout seul, la gravité, ça je peux le faire. Il suffit d'ouvrir son cœur et euh, ça sort. Je me sens assez proche de cet homme en fait, donc j'ai pas eu besoin de penser à lui en tout cas, du tout. D'ailleurs je ne joue pas un Bert Malzan, je joue Grégoire Canvel et Grégoire Canvel n'existe pas ou n'existe qu'à travers moi donc je joue à partir de moi. Le scénario est très très bien écrit. C'est très fin, c'est très rare qu'une femme aussi jeune dise des choses aussi profondes sur l'espèce humaine, sur la vie quoi. Et euh, c'est très touchant. Enfin, les enfants d'abord je les ai rencontrés, elles m'ont fait la gueule les deux petites. Elle ne voulait pas me voir, elle me... je me suis dit ça commence bien. C'était bien parce que si elle voulait être très loin de moi, ça veut dire qu'un jour elles vont être très proches. Donc, ça veut dire qu'elle s'était intelligente, timide, donc elle s'éloigne. Après, je, 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 je sais faire avec les enfants, j'ai des enfants. Et, et c'est ma fille qui joue le, la fille aînée, c'est ma vraie fille. Les, les petites filles, elles n'apprenaient pas le texte vraiment, donc il euh, y avait un tout petit peu d'improvisation. Et jouer avec des enfants, bah, c'est périlleux parce que moi j'essaie de glisser le texte quand même. Elles, elles le disent aussi, ça dépend des moments, mais elles, 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 les faisaient, elles leur faisaient pas apprendre le texte. Elles laissaient la vie venir, elles leur racontaient tout de suite l'histoire avant. Comment ça, on va faire ça, tu vas faire ça, là tu peux dire ça ou ça. Sinon elles récitent très vite les enfants très petits. Je leur ai demandé déjà jamais apprendre leur texte. Et pendant les scènes, je leur donnais un canevas, je leur disais en gros de, de quoi ça retournait. Et puis, et puis je leur expliquais de, les, les choses principales, mais je, je, les, je les forçais un petit peu à dire les phrases avec leurs propres mots. Et j'essayais autant que possible de ne de, de de pas leur montrer mes dialogues, parce que j'étais convaincue qu'elles le diraient mieux que moi avec, avec leurs mots à elles. Et donc elles, elles ont été quand même très, à la fois très dirigées, très encadrées et très libres. La chose qui restera sans doute le plus, c'est que. Euh, mon père est mort au milieu du tournage, donc euh, ça a changé les choses un tout petit peu. Ça fait que tout d'un coup, euh, c'est un moment de ma vie, ce tournage. Je suis devenu un adulte pendant ce film. J'ai vu la première fois le film hier, et je savais que ce serait aussi bien que ça. C'est encore mieux que je ne pensais. Pas voudrait que je lui dise quelque chose de gentil. Te amo, te adoro. Bon alors je voulais vous dire bravo parce que j'ai lu votre scénario ce matin dans le bus et je l'ai trouvé magnifique. Yanson c'est le mec qui tourne que quand ça lui chante. Ça a du charme. Enfin moi à chaque jour de tournage à l'année ça me coûte 20 000 euros. Pourquoi tu produis des trucs pareils T'es maso. C'est quand même pas une évidence commerciale ton cinéaste. C'est un génie. Bah alors où est-ce que c'est Valentine <rire> Allô La dette s'élève à presque un million d'euros plus les intérêts. Vous êtes conscient que la prochaine étape c'est une saisie sur vos comptes J'aimerais beaucoup que tu décides d'être heureuse. On est en train de se noyer. Mais non, on se noie pas. Il y a des solutions, mais il faut tenir. Qu'est-ce qui se passera, Grégoire, si la banque vous lâche Je sais pas. J'arrive plus, c'est fini. Comment ça, c'est fini C'est un tel échec. C'est un échec financier. Mais regarde le chemin incroyable qu'elle t'a parcouru. Pourquoi elle a fait ça Je suis toute. Avec du silence. Je crois qu'elle était fière de produire mon film et qu'elle aurait voulu le terminer. 
c'est vrai. Je vais défendre la société jusqu'au bout. Mais les pensées à l'avenir, ça, ça me donne du courage. Tu ne me quitteras pas. Je ne te quitterai jamais. Je t'aime.